great. Great, so welcome back everyone. Oh, if it's your first time, welcome. Uh, we're, today we're gonna start with a video. Uh, we're talking about St. Ignatius' rules of discernment today. Um, so we're gonna start off with a video about St. Ignatius, just to kind of give you context of his life. And then you'll also see why it's really relevant for understanding where the rules of discernment came from. Uh, so we'll, we'll start with this little three minute video clip. Now imagine it is the year 1521. Picture a young, proud Basque soldier who is no stranger to a life of excess, making a battlefield confession to a fellow soldier before a six-hour fight. Outnumbered, outgunned. Yet, he refuses to accept retreat or surrender. Inigo Lopez Loyola suffered a crippling injury, underwent barbarous surgeries, and faced a prolonged recovery. And yet something else was at work in him. It started with imagining what his life would be like when he recovered from this injury and returned to his life of money, women, and fighting. But these dreams seemed to be souring. In his long recovery, he had two books to read, The Life of Christ and Lives of the Saints. One can almost imagine the size of resignation as the young man reached for the books. What started as a way to pass the time became the source of some new dreams. As Inigo read about the saints, he began to imagine what his life would be like if he emulated their devotion to God and their lives of selfless service to others. As he went back and forth between these dreams of his future, he began to be more and more drawn to the life of Christ and the lives of the saints. Saint Ignatius wrote, When I was thinking of the things of the world, I was filled with delight. But afterwards, when I dismissed them from weariness, I was dry and dissatisfied. And when I thought of going barefoot to Jerusalem and of eating nothing but herbs and performing the other rigors I saw that the saints had performed, I was consoled. Not only when I entertained these thoughts, but even after dismissing them, I remained cheerful and satisfied. One night, unable to sleep, he experienced a vision of the Blessed Virgin Mary and the child Jesus. And this experience filled him with lasting joy. And from that time on, thoughts of returning to his old way of living, he found loathsome. This became the foundation for one of his most important gifts to the world, the discernment of spirits. And this was the beginning of the path this man would take to become Saint Ignatius Loyola, author of the Spiritual Exercises, another beautiful gift to the world, and founder of the Society of Jesus, commonly known as the Jesuits. His life was not without hardships, physical ailments, suspicions, imprisonments, but his path never wavered as he strove for what he called helping souls. Right. Now imagine this incredible saint as your companion and guide, yeah, leading you ever closer to seeing God's hand at work in all the So they sort of end with a little, you know, take home, but we have a whole talk for that, so. So uh, let's, uh, let's begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord God, we thank you for the life of St. Ignatius of Loyola, and we thank you for all the gifts you give us through the church of learning about the spiritual life. I ask you tonight to give me the words which you wish me to speak, the ideas you wish me to share, and open hearts to receive your Holy Spirit's words. Lord, I ask that we may leave tonight more confident in you and more able to uh, tackle any discouragement we may face in our prayer lives. Help us to grow in community and fellowship with each other and give us an unwavering faith and hope in your goodness. We ask all this through the intercession of St. Ignatius, through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Right? So this story, um, I don't know if you've ever heard that, the story of St. Ignatius, um, but he experienced this severe injury in battle, and he wanted to be this great soldier. So his dreams were dashed. And uh, he really, uh, one biographer says, until the age of 30, he was basically given over to the vanities of the world. And even while he was recovering from this uh, like shattered leg, he didn't like the way that his leg healed. And so he actually had his leg rebroken, and so it could heal back in a more aesthetic looking way. Um, and so he was willing to suffer these pains for the sort of vanities of the world. But then when he was given over to the things of God, he w became this soldier for God. Um, and so just really inspiring saint. He spent like months in, the, in a cave trying to live like other saints and things like that. Uh, but uh, so I liked the video because it really emphasized his discernment of spirits when he was in this bed recovering from surgery. So it says after he read these books about knighthood and worldly things, he would experience this initial like spark of happiness, but then discouragement after. And then when he read about the lives of the saints and of Christ, he would experience, you know, kind of slow growing joy and hope, but then a lasting happiness afterwards. Uh, and this really formed the foundation of his discernment of spirits, which we're, we'll talk about today. Um, so to kind of bring it more home, uh, I'm going to give examples from a book. Uh, and the next slide has uh, a book by Father Timothy Gallagher. It's called Setting Captives Free, Reflections on Ignatian Discernment of Spirits. And you'll find it on the bottom of your sheet. Um, so from this book and then from a class at St. Vincent Seminary by Father Boniface is really where I learned about these rules. And if you look up this book, it will go through each rule one by one. Uh, but tonight I'm kind of giving an overview, so I'll just handpick a couple of the most impactful rules. Uh, but if you want more, you can, you can definitely go here. Uh, so the next slide gives an example of, in the book, he gives a lot of case studies, which I think are really helpful. Um, so we'll start with two case studies to kind of show the context for what we're learning about tonight. Uh, the first example is of uh, someone named Gerald. So Gerald is a 41-year-old married man who, after 20 years away from the church, has recently returned to the sacraments. For six months now, he has faithfully attended Sunday Mass with his family and is making sincere efforts to overcome earlier patterns of sinfulness. He rejoices at the new peace he experiences and the new harmony in his family and at work. And so this is kind of, you know, I think this is something you see in the world today, you know, a common experience of people coming back to the church and then things are getting better and then now he's, you'll see what happens next with his life of prayer. Today, Gerald is attending Sunday Mass. The Gospel is Luke 11, 1 through 13, Lord, teach us to pray. The priest gives a simple but heartfelt homily on prayer and invites his parishioners to consider spending 10 minutes a day in prayer with the readings of the Mass for that day. As Gerald listens, he feels God's closeness and his heart is warmed with gratitude to God for the goodness of what is happening in his life. A thought comes to him. If simply praying once a week at Sunday Mass is already making this difference, what would happen if I did what Father is suggesting? and prayed daily. Further thoughts arise. I could certainly arrange my morning to set aside 10 minutes each day. And actually, all I have to do is ask my wife for help, because she has been doing this for some years. She will be happy to show me how to find the readings and get started. Gerald resolves that he will speak with his wife that evening when the children are in bed and will begin this practice the next morning. So we've probably all had moments like this. We get an inspiration during Mass or some other spiritual experience, and we make some kind of resolution. Um, and so let's see what happens next on the next slide. The day continues with his various activities. At supper, a tension arises between Gerald and his teenage son and does not resolve well. This tension burdens Gerald's heart as the evening unfolds. Now the children, now the children are asleep, and Gerald is in his study, preparing for work the next morning. 
He remembers that he had planned to speak at this time with his wife about the 10 minutes each day with scripture. But now the thoughts are different. Who are you kidding? You've been away from the church for 20 years and look at the way, the way you've lived. You've never even read scripture. What makes you think you'll understand anything written there? Why approach your wife about a practice that is bound to fail? You'll just embarrass yourself and her. You had a nice experience at mass this morning, but that doesn't change anything, and it is not going to last. Now, Gerald does not feel God's closeness and the warm gratitude to God, spiritual consolation, that he felt at mass that morning is gone. He feels no energy for spiritual things and no desire to pray or begin new steps in prayer. So now we kind of see him falling into spiritual desolation. We can probably all relate to this. Uh, you know, we, we, we had a great idea, and then it comes time to do it, and we just have all these dis this discouragement and these negative thoughts. Uh, so let's see what, what happens next. Gerald is now experiencing spiritual desolation, a heaviness of heart specifically on the level of his spiritual life and relationship with God. The non-spiritual desolation which was, you know, the things that weren't related to spiritual things. Oh, oh great, thank you. Uh, the non-spiritual desolation created a vulnerability into which the enemy has brought the discouraging trap of spiritual desolation. Very often this will be the pattern. So we're, soon we'll explain the distinction between all these things. Uh, but just to kind of give you the example of his story, he kind of goes through all these spiritual and non-spiritual phases. We readily perceive that what happens next matters. If Gerald succumbs to the enemy's obstacle, placing action, the obstacle placing action, and does not speak with his wife that evening, what will his prayer look like a week later, a month, a year, five years? But if with courage and spiritual awareness, Gerald rejects this action of the enemy, holds firm to the grace of the Mass that morning, speaks with his wife, and begins the 10 minutes the following morning, what will his prayer look like now, a week, a month, a year, and five years later? Right here in the silence of this evening, a key decision is being made regarding spiritual growth, and right here is where Ignatius wants to help us. Most of the spiritual life consists of precisely such situations and decisions, quiet, generally unseen, small decisions that shape our spiritual journey. The wisdom of the Ignatian rules, living the discerning life, can make all the difference. And so this is the longest thing I'll read tonight, but, <laughs> but uh, you get, you get, I think it just shows the whole picture of everything we'll talk about. And this, I hope you can all relate to this kind of experience, these kind of thoughts, um, and these moments that th this small change could just completely blossom his spiritual life. When you multiply that 10 minutes a day, time across the years, it's like, it's really powerful. Uh, so one more example. Uh, Philip is a man who loves the Lord. He usually ends his day at 10 p.m. with some minutes of reading scripture and the examined prayer, which is like an examination of conscience, sort of going through uh, any sins of the day, offering that up to God's mercy, and then thinking about the blessings of the day. Uh, it's a great practice at the end of the day. This has been a day of spiritual desolation, however, and this evening Philip feels no inclination to pray. As he sits at his desk, a few inches in front of one hand is the Bible, and a few inches in front of the other is his smartphone. Nothing in Philip wants to reach out for the Bible, and everything in him wants to reach out for the smartphone. And one touch of the screen will become 50, then 100, or more. Philip is experiencing the movement to low and earthly things that characterizes spiritual desolation. We may repeat once again that there is no shame in experiencing this pull. And I think this is an important point at the end, which Father Gallagher brings out. Um, everybody experiences these spiritual desolations, these temptations. And uh, if you read the life of the saints, you know that they battled against them. Um, and so the enemy wants to make us feel like we're the only ones experiencing discouragement or such things, uh, temptations. But as long as we don't consent to it, it really has no power over our soul unless we give it power. Um, so that's the goal tonight is to give you power to resist these kind of things and what to do when this happens. 
so if you look at your handout, we've got this grid of non-spiritual consolation, <laughs> non-spiritual desolation, spiritual consolation, and spiritual desolation. And so the, the first four rules of St. Ignatius really break this down uh, and give us an example of what these things are. Um, and the thing, the thing to note about uh, consolation and desolation is it changes once you enter the mansions, as we talked about the first week. So once you begin this journey of discipleship, following Jesus really intensely, um, like if when he becomes your number one priority, then the spiritual life changes. So before, um, yeah, before that conversion moment, a lot of people who are sort of entrenched in sin, maybe mortal sin, they'll experience uh, consolation when they sin, and they'll experience like desolation when they start following the things of God. Um, but, and they sort of, you know, they're kind of spiraling, spiraling down a dark path. And so, uh, but when someone enters the spiritual life, has a conversion, consolation will come from spiritual things and they'll be encouraged by following God and desolation will come like after they've sinned. And so it kind of reverses. So that's really what St. Ignatius' first two rules talk about. Um, and then his third and fourth rules talk about what these are. Um, so non-spiritual consolation. This is a delight in the things of earth. So uh, this, can be, this can be a good thing because God wants us to have happiness of the things he's created. Um, and so just because it's not spiritual consolation, don't think it's sinful or something. Um, God wants us to have happiness with family, friends, beautiful stories. Um, but they're all things that aren't directly related to God. Uh, they can be if you lift them up and you thank God for them. Um, but these are things that everyone experiences no matter what their prayer life is like. They'll experience the good things of the world at different points. Um, so the key thing is they're not directly re related to God, sort of this natural happiness. So non-spiritual desolation, this really comes from two main sources. Uh, the first is tiredness, which is a deficiency in physical energy. Uh, it could be you're sick, you're ill, you have some indigestion, uh, something wrong with your body, maybe you didn't sleep well. So the tiredness is kind of the first category. And desolation is when something is missing, that you feel desolate. Um, St. Augustine talks about evil as the lack of good. And so it's a lack of something. Um, so it could be physical energy. It can also be emotional energy, such as sort of a depressed mood. If you had a discouraging conversation or some kind of discouraging life event, maybe things aren't going well at work or there's family issues. These are all non-spiritual desolation, and it's important to distinguish this uh, so you don't make everything spiritual. Um, so the next one is spiritual consolation. So there's kind of, you don't have to get all this down. I also have cheat sheets in the back after if you want to just take some. But, so just write whatever helps you. Um, Spiritual consolation really is related to God. So non-spiritual is not directly related to God. Spiritual consolation is uh, really gifts of God in, the prayer, in your prayer life, in your spiritual life. So joy, delight, happiness in God, Jesus, the scriptures, the church, the saints. So like when St. Ignatius was reading the life of Christ and the life of the saints, he was becoming uh, more and more consoled about this new vision of life that he never had before. For him, his number one goal before was to be a great warrior, to have a beautiful wife, and maybe sleep around. And uh, he would even, he got involved with some robbery where people were trying to kill him. And <laughs> so he just, he had, his priorities were in the world and that was his vision of life. But then the spiritual consolation opened up a whole new vision um, of what's possible. And like we talked about the first week, um, we really can't even imagine all the things that are possible in the spiritual life. It'll just, God will continue to surprise us along our journey. 
and blow our minds and just blow us out of the water. And there's these moments of consolation where we're just in awe. Like we can't even respond. We're just overwhelmed by God. So I hope you've all had moments like that. Um, and I hope even more in the future. Uh, a lot of times this leaves you with a great determination toward one's own salvation. So you're really eager to follow the commandments. To, you're renewed to live for God once and for all. You make these excited sort of vows to God. Uh, Mother Teresa made a vow that she would never refuse the Lord anything under pain of mortal sin, which I don't know if I would make that vow, but she, she was in a moment of spiritual consolation, and she was like, this is possible. I'm going to just give God everything and never look back. And in these moments, we often feel that. And they might come with knowledge. God might give gifts of knowledge uh, because the heaven is really the beatific vision is we'll know God and be known. And so knowledge is really what we're made for, this unfolding knowledge of who God is and who we are. So that's consolation. It's probably a little easier to describe. The spiritual desolation, uh, Father Gallagher likes to describe it as a heavy movement of the heart, which is related to your relationship with God. We have all of those moments when our hearts just feel heavy and the things of the spiritual life just are unappealing. It, when we, uh, we're sort of, we have a movement to low and earthly things, it might come with a lot of agitations and temptations, a lack of confidence without hope, without love. Uh, Saint Ignatius, these are St. Ignatius' words. He says, you find yourself totally slothful, tepid, sad, and as if separated from one's create, creator and Lord. Um, and sloth, I think, it's one of the seven deadly sins, you know, sloth, and or called it a chadia. And this, I think, is so common today. It might even be the deadliest sin in our culture. When you think about all the distractions of social media and the internet, a lot of times we're just roaming curious through all this sort of junk, you know, stuff that's not really leading us to God. And so the sloth is really a big temptation. Uh, discouragement, anxiety, shame, lies of Id about identity. This is really, uh, Satan will tempt someone in spiritual desolation with lies about who they are. Do you think God really loves you? Uh, this, this prayer is never going to work. Nothing's ever going to change. And the last, the last prayer is slow, painful, distracted. And Father Gallagher really... Up so I hope you're not getting confused with our Father Gallagher, but Father Tim Timothy Gallagher, I don't think they're related. But uh, he, he likes this phrase of desolation. There's a sense of irreparable disaster. So things aren't going to get better. It's going to be like this forever. It's almost this experience of hell. Like, I'm going to be like this forever. It's never going to get better. I'll never be happy again. But it's, it's spiritual. So... I'll make a point here about kind of the difference between psychological depression and spiritual desolation, because I think that's really important. Um, so spiritual desolation, it really occurs when we're trying to follow God. So someone like Mother Teresa, she experienced almost 40 years in this desolation. It was sort of a special trial, which uh, God gifted her in a way uh, to test her faith and be a witness to all of us. But for her, it was really when she went to pray, she would experience this lack of faith and trust and discouragement. But the rest of her life, she continued being able to do these activities, which uh, were a blessing to other people. She was always smiling. Everyone was really encouraged by her. Uh, the difference with psychological depression and other things is that... Um, our life will kind of fall apart too. It's not just our times in prayer, but everything in life is affected. Uh, or we might not be able to keep a job or uh, serve our family or fulfill our vocation. Um, so that's a way to distinguish, and it can be hard to distinguish. So it's important to really have a trusted spiritual mentor or a spiritual director if you're trying to distinguish uh, that in yourself. 
because um, I know a lot of people struggle with depression and then also their spiritual life, they're trying to distinguish, uh, do I need therapy or is this just God testing me? And that's an important thing to be honest and discern. Um, so I hope that, hope that makes sense. So any questions on these four categories? Because sometimes it's not totally clear, but hopefully this helps give you a, a way to sort of discern, again, discerning the, if it's spiritual, non-spiritual, um, consolation and desolation. So uh, first I'm going to kind of talk about how to respond to non-spiritual desolation. Um, and like reasons why we have non-spiritual desolation and what to do. Um, so the first thing is exhaustion, physically or emotionally. Uh, that's probably the major cause of non-spiritual desolation. You might think, oh, I'm so distracted in prayer. God must be testing me. It's like, well, maybe it's because you only got four hours of sleep last night. You know, <laughs> So it's not really spiritual. Um, or maybe you just had a really emotional week. And it's not so much spiritual, it's just situational. So the, the solution there is obviously have some rest and leisure. And God wants you to take care of yourself. Uh, something that's really helped me is with that second part of the greatest commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, Brene Brown, she's a popular psychologist, she says, the love you have for yourself actually limits the love you have for others. If you sort of flip it the other way. So if you have a really low love for yourself and you don't take care of yourself, then if you love your neighbor as yourself, that's going to be low too. Um, so that really helps. Sometimes we have a false idea of a saint as someone who just, you know, there's a self-forgetfulness, but they still take care of themselves so that they can take care of others. Uh, the second reason for non-spiritual desolation and dryness is just a lack of formation in prayer. Um, you might want to pray, but you're not sure how, or you don't know where to start. Um, so just exposure of ways to pray, such as Lectio Divina, Ignatian Meditation, Liturgy of the Hours. We're going to talk about Liturgy of the Hours next week. Um, and the last week will be how to pray a holy hour. So I'll give you a ton of resources about all that. Um, so you're all doing good there. More exposure to prayer skills. The third one is inconsistent prayer times. And so this isn't, this could come from spiritual desolation, but it's not itself a spiritual desolation. And so the solution here is just to, you know, ask God for the grace to have those consistent prayer times. And maybe an accountability partner or a small group. The fourth reason is disharmony between prayer and life in a moral sense. So our, our moral life actually affects our prayer in a big way. Uh, as St. John of the Cross talks about that purification, like the burning log image we talked about. Um, God wants to strip away everything that distances us from him, sin, and other things. So that can make prayer difficult. The fifth one, this is really common for me, is a need to share with God a burden, a fear, a shame, or anxiety. And so this is kind of what we talked about last week with that vulnerable dialogue with the Lord. You might want to journal something that's on your heart that's really pressing. Uh, Father Timothy Gallagher, he talks about someone whose prayer had been hard for six months, and there was kind of this situation with his wife that he wasn't bringing into prayer. And he was trying to pray and just ignore that, but he wasn't bringing that to God, and that was blocking his prayer. And the last reason is actually from a healthy growth in prayer. So when we talked about the three ways of the spiritual life and the two dark nights, if you're entering one of those dark nights, uh, it's, not, it's sort of different than spiritual desolation. It's a purification of God. So a lot of times desolation, spiritual desolation comes from the enemy, but these purifications and these dark nights can come from God. And so there's, there's a nuance there, um, and it's good to sort of discern that with a spiritual director. Uh, the, your former methods of prayer may no longer be working. 
And God may call you into a more contempt, contemplative type of prayer where you might have meditated a certain way before and it's not working anymore. So just receiving what God is doing there. All right, so now we kind of get to the meat, meaty part of the, the talk. Is what do I do when it is spiritual desolation? And so we'll dive deep into St. Ignatius' rules. Uh, and this first one is the most memorable, I think. If you get nothing else from this talk, it's uh, in spiritual desolation, never make a change. So if we could all say that together. Never make a change. Yeah. So let's we'll say it one more time. We'll say in spiritual desolation, never make a change. Okay. In spiritual desolation, never make a change. So this, if you get nothing else, it's this. So the way St. Ignatius puts it is be firm and constant in the resolutions and determination in which one was the day preceding such desolation or in the determination in which he was in the preceding consolation. So again, as we said about consolation, you have these great resolutions, these things you want to do for God, and you feel God speaking them to you in a powerful way. And then desolation comes, and your biggest temptation is going to be to change. Say, that wasn't what God wanted me to do. This is impossible. I don't want to do this. And so if we can hold fast to this rule um, of just remembering the last time we were in consolation, which may be weeks ago, it might just be a day ago, then we can really serve God well. And so he wrote these rules from a lot of experience with spiritual direction and his own interior life. So I've seen this over and over in my life. So the second rule that I reference is actually is rule 13. And he says, reveal everything to your spiritual director or another spiritual person. So the spiritual directors can be hard to find. Uh, we don't have enough of them, unfortunately. Uh, and the Ign St. Ignatius has sort of a you know, provocative almost image of this. He says the enemy or Satan acts as a licentious lover and wanting to be secret and not revealed. When the daughter reveals to her father, it is very grievous to him because he's, so like if a daughter, you know, reveals to her father that she's having this affair or some relationship, uh, the, the sort of boy with this girl, is grievous to him because he gathers from his manifest deceits being discovered that he will not be able to succeed with his wickedness begun. So it's sort of this image of, like, when you bring something to your spiritual director, you open up to a priest or a trusted spiritual mentor, then the devil sees that somebody else knows about what's happening. And he's like this, you know, this lover who's having an affair, and he's like, now people know, and he runs away, and he's not even going to try, you know. So this is Ignatius's image. So God's almost using his past life to give images of the way the devil acts. Um, and this, this rule, I put it second because these two have made the most difference in my life personally. So I found when I, you know, I might have this really weird or ugly temptation or strange thought, and I'm like, well, I don't want to tell my spiritual director about it because it's really awkward or uncomfortable. But then I remember St. Ignatius, like, reveal everything. And, and I'll put it, like, first on my list for spiritual direction. Like, I'm going to talk about this first. And then not make a change. I'm going to, you know, no matter how, how awkward it is. Uh, and sometimes I'll go to confession at the beginning of spiritual direction. So I kind of have the power and the grace of that sacrament to make this, you know, bring this out in the open with someone else. Uh, and spiritual direction, it, it doesn't have the exact same seal as confession, but it's very close. So really the spiritual director is not going to share anything from spiritual direction. And that really is a big comfort as well. Um, so that's, uh, these two are just, have been such graces in my life. So the third point is St. Ignatius' sixth rule. And it's, so the last two, well, the first one is don't make a change, right? It's sort of what, what you don't do, but then you might ask, what do you do when you're in spiritual desolation? So his sixth rule talks about this. 
He, he gives four things. Uh, the first one is prayer, and specifically intercessory prayer. So ask God for the grace to endure this desolation or to be consoled soon. And so, again, it comes to that vulnerability in prayer. You could pray a prayer like, Lord, can you please take this from me? I need you now. Don't let me carry this alone. Help me, Lord. So these sort of prayers of petition, intercession, asking God's help, uh, like the Psalms. And I even think of Jesus, you know, experiencing his passion. He prays, Lord, please let this chalice pass from me. And even though God doesn't answer that prayer, there's an exchange there of trust, which is, I think that's what is important from that. The second thing is meditation. So this could be reading scripture, listening to a worship song, writing in your journal. And this really is just activating the thoughts of God in your mind again. So it's thinking about the things of God, thinking about higher, higher things, thinking about the goal of heaven, and the pains of hell, like the confession prayer. So it's bringing to mind spiritual truths. So maybe you turn on like Bible in a year in your car, or you listen to We Are One Body Radio, or uh, something like that. It can be something very, very simple, but it's just that little, uh, Father Boniface likes to call it a little counter turn. So if you're sort of beginning this spiral of darkness and desolation, it's like just make a quarter turn the other way. And it doesn't have to be very intimidating, just like reverse that turn and that spiral. The fourth thing is examination. So you might have heard the quote from Plato, the un unexamined life is not worth living. And so when we experience desolation, is you can ask questions like, what am I feeling specifically? I don't know if you've seen like a feelings wheel where it has different words on the outside of broad categories like anger, sadness, confusion, and then you narrow down your feelings. So you can kind of pick words that accurately describe what you're going through. And this could help if you're going to talk to a spiritual director or someone, or even just a friend about what you're feeling. Then you can ask, when did this start? And try to trace it back. Maybe it was something non-spiritual. And so figuring that out, or maybe it's a specific temptation. So uh, I know for me, like last week, before, the, before this talk last week, I was experiencing a lot of spiritual desolation. I was like, this isn't going to work. I'm like the talk isn't going to go well. No one's going to show up. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm not prepared. You know, all these like terrible thoughts and uh, just a lot of discouragement. And so sort of examining it. It's like, well, maybe the devil doesn't want this talk to go well. So, like, let me pray to God, you know. Let me remember why I'm doing this, why I'm in seminary, why I'm excited to be here, excited for this opportunity, you know. So, using all these things. And this is, this is really a great line. So, when you start doing these things, it's no longer myself in desolation, but it's myself reflecting on myself in desolation. So you almost can step outside yourself and, you know, consider yourself from the outside, so to speak. And then you're no longer just in this dark hole, but you can almost look at yourself in the hole and be like, why am I in this hole? What can I do? God help me come out. And then the last thing St. Ignatius recommends is some small penance. And so you might have heard, uh, I think, there's somewhere in the gospel where it's like this demon can only come out by fasting and prayer. And a lot of the spiritual masters talk about if you have prayer without fasting, it loses almost all its power. Or um, I know that uh, Father Friedi in his return talk, he, when we're praying for our family to return to the Catholic Church, uh, he asks, he'll ask parents, um, you know, are you praying for your kids? And they almost always say yes. And then he says, are you fasting for them? It's like, well, I don't know if I want to, you know. So this, this small penance, it could just be like not eating snacks during the day or staying five minutes longer in prayer than you usually do. And these things really make the enemy run because the enemy sees you're serious at resisting and you're going to make sacrifices for that. Um, 
And if it's something bigger, like bigger penance, it should be discerned with a spiritual director. So um, the last thing, the last point here is desolation will often tell us, I, I had got to do this now. So this temptation that's like, you know, I have to look at this now or I have to give in to this now. It's like now or never. Um, so really we have to resist that. And then this isn't just a try harder mentality, but it's really acts of love. And so we have to come back to this isn't just a willpower based thing. This isn't a self-help program. This is a love exchange between us and God and to remain in that relationship. So rule eight is interesting with St. Ignatius. He suggests, think that you will soon be consoled. And uh, desolation often makes us think, you know, this will never get better. Nothing I can do will make this temptation go away. And Father Timothy Gallagher recommends writing in your journal, what I'm writing now, I will read in consolation. And I know for me, sometimes I will go back in my journal and see these movements of consolation and desolation and they'll just encourage me to read through like a cycle of that maybe i'll start in desolation and then see how the lord consoled me pretty soon after and that'll just help me remember the the famous saying this too shall pass and so thinking of desolation like a cloud on a stormy day you know that cloud is going to pass eventually even in pittsburgh where we might have clouds for a while (laughs) the sun always comes out again so So this is a a helpful thought. The fifth point, this combines rules seven and nine of St. Ignatius, is to consider why the Lord allows us to be in desolation. So it's almost thinking like theologically here. The first one is to heal us uh, because it's our own fault. And so this is usually the most common thought in desolation is this is all my fault, I must be sinning. Um, but if you read the book of Job, you know that he experiences a lot of trials, that it's n- not anything of, uh, from his sin, um, but it's God testing him, which is a la- the later points. Uh, but sometimes it is our own fault. So it's important, uh, like we might have become tepid, lazy, or negligent in our spiritual exercises, like St. Ignatius says. So just an honest self-examination. The second point is to help us grow. And St. Ignatius said, this purifies our mercenary love. Uh, So another way to think about the three stages of the interior life is uh, the purgative way is uh, you're at Jesus' feet as sort of this mercenary. And then it's like you're at Jesus' side as like his servant, and then you're at his heart in the unitive way of like this love relationship or like his face, you know. So... But a lot of times in our spiritual life, we'll fall back into this mercenary uh, behavior where we're just serving God for the good things he gives us, like for pay almost. And God wants to purify of this, purify us of this, so he allows us to go into desolation to test our love. Um, a good thing to remember is St. Thomas Aquinas says, things are not more mer- meritorious the harder they are. The trial is not good for its own sake. So we just want to remember that, like, it's not good to be in desolation. And God actually doesn't want that unless it will lead to a greater good. So that thought can really help us endure. And then the third reason is to prevent a fall. So this will grow our humility and remind us that everything is a gift. Um, so someone might grow in their spiritual life and start thinking, I'm, I'm the best prayer I know. I must be awesome. I'm so good at prayer. And then God will allow desolation to come. It's like, oh, maybe I'm not, you know. (laughs) Um, And so a friend told me this, which I come back to all the time. God doesn't lead us anywhere that makes us need him less. And if you just sit with that, uh, if you think about the trials in your life, maybe right before that trial, you are in this place of sort of overconfidence. Like, look, I got my life together. Everything's going so well, I must be great, you know? And then God is like, really? Like, like you did all this without me, you know? Like, where am I in your life? 
And so he might sort of plunge us in the cold water and help us wake up a little bit. And like Jesus' ascension, it is better for you that I go. And so there's something where Jesus actually became more distant from his disciples. And not, not only helped them grow, but it was really humbling. Like, what do we do now? You know, God, I need you more. And Holy Spirit, come. So these are, it's helpful to meditate on these theological reasons why we might experience desolation. And then this is the last uh, point, which is sort of a, it's a nice little reverse sort of trick on the, the devil. So St. Ignatius encourages us to notice the enemy's strategy. And so the enemy will attack where your defenses are weakest. And so this kind of, this probably came from his soldier days when he was, wanted to be this great military guy. Um, so the way he puts it is, the enemy behaves as a chief bent on conquering. Looking at the forces or defenses of a stronghold, he attacks it on the weakest side. In like manner, the enemy of human nature roaming about looks in turn at all our virtues, theological, cardinal, and moral. Uh, so theological, faith, hope, and love. The cardinal virtues like temperance, temperance, justice, fortitude, prudence. Uh, those are all good things to study. And then and where he finds, where the enemy finds us weakest and most in need for our eternal salvation, there he attacks us and aims at taking us. And so through this method, by understanding this, desolation actually teaches us where we most need to grow in the spiritual life. So the devil doesn't really want to waste time. Like he's already, he already knows he's lost. He just wants to get us to go away from God and like get dragged down to hell with him. So th- he'll, he, in wasting no time, he's going to attack us where we're weakest. And so you might notice, you know, even after a decade of the spiritual life, it's like you keep getting attacked in the same place. And you're like, oh, I'm sick of this problem, you know. But that's where, you know, being honest with your spiritual director, meditating on those causes that you might even, like therapy can be helpful for some of those things like talking through maybe like with your relationship with your parents from the past or different wounds in your past. So places where we're weak, that's where the devil attacks us. Um, so this rule just really encourages us to reverse his attacks to help us grow stronger. And we have to be confident in resisting these attacks. Uh, rule 12, it's a very politically incorrect rule. He kind of talks about uh, the enemy almost like this relationship between a man and a woman. And he says, like, you know, when the man just strongly resists the woman, she just backs off. But if if the man sort of, uh, if he's just sort of like a wash rag, as my mom would say, the woman's just going to, like, make him do whatever he wants. You know, so that's sort of like trope in stories. Ignatius talks about that and says, resist the devil strongly and he'll run. You know, St. James says the same thing in his epistle. Um, but I think it's a helpful, you know, he gives us these images uh, that helps us remember uh, the, when we're in desolation, it's hard to remember these things. So hopefully you hold on to this handout and uh, you can reference these things or maybe read more from Father Timothy Gallagher and St. Ignatius himself. So... Um, so to sort of close, Father Timothy's book is called Setting Captives Free. And so he, he explains why does this set captives free. He says, the beauty of all this, to use a somewhat unexpected word when speaking of spiritual desolation, is that everything about it is a lie, either an outright lie or a truth that desolation skews and mixes with a lie. When we perceive this, captives are set free to reject the lie and walk firmly toward the Lord they love. So all those lies that come to us in desolation, this will never get better, Uh, God doesn't love you, all these things that are running through our mind. He said this is almost, the the beauty of learning these rules is that it strengthens us to reject those things and to remember what we're shown in the light when we walk through the darkness and to rely on the Lord more and more in that love relationship which the Lord is drawing us through these things for our good and for a greater good. 
sometimes it's for someone else's good, you know. So, um, so, uh, so each week I've kind of been recommending a song. So that I have this on the bottom of the sheet, but this is a song I kind of gone to in desolation, and it's called Trust by Strayhon. It's sort of like almost this disco type of song, but uh, <laughs> it's just the, the lyrics are very profound, so I thought I'd share it with you. You can look it up uh, on your own. And uh, you probably have some, maybe you have some favorite like praise songs or worship songs related to God that you can go to when you're experiencing desolation, and that's a great strategy. Um, so let's, uh, let's cl- close in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord God, we ask you to come and strengthen us in all the areas where we are weak, and to help us remember these things, as you promised, uh, to send your Holy Spirit and remind us of all that you teach us uh, when we most need it. And I just ask for all those experiencing desolation right now in the church, I just ask that you give them manifold graces uh, through our Blessed Mother and through all the saints to endure and win the prize of victory, which you desire us to, uh, to fight for and to win. So through that zeal of St. Ignatius, uh, and that warrior spirit for the things of God, I just ask you give us that grace um, and also just uh, with the image of the castle and areas that are weak in our walls, I just ask Jesus to come and stand in the breach, stand in those holes or weaknesses in our walls, any wounds or uh, places that we'd rather not have open, um, places where we may be bleeding spiritually. I just ask Jesus to come in and with his healing touch, heal those places And even if there are places that stay open, it's for him to remain there, and we remain there with him. So, Lord, I just thank you for these rules. I thank you for your wisdom, your encouragement, your guidance, which is with us our whole life long. And we ask all these things as we pray as you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. St. Ignatius of Loyola, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all so much for coming. And uh, next week will be Liturgy of the Hours. Uh, so we're, for part of it, we're going to pray evening prayer together. And I'll sort of explain what, what the Liturgy of the Hours are and uh, familiarize with you with uh, this great practice uh, and form of prayer of the church. So I'm looking forward to it. And uh, yeah, have a blessed evening.